population and you see how there's an increase with every, every year that, the, that there is no huge increase in, in excess deaths. There is no 200, 300,000 excess deaths. And this is the CDC data here. And then what this graph shows, it's, uh, you can't read the print, but this is showing the comparison of what's been going on since 2014. And every peak you see there is that winter increase in deaths. More people die in the winter than in the other seasons of the year. And it shows that every, every year there's this huge peak. And for all of those years, uh, up to uh, 2020, the top three killers are coronary artery disease, you know, having heart attacks, chronic lung disease, and pneumonia. Those are the three every year, except for last year. Now, what happened? Did people suddenly stop dying of heart attacks and chronic lung disease and pneumonia? Before I answer that question, that last part on the right-hand side in that uh, separate uh, column there shows the dramatic drop in those three categories. And it shows a dramatic increase in COVID-19 deaths. And they just happened to match. So what this shows you is there was miscoding of the reason for death. And ones that were attributed to COVID were actually due to the same chronic causes of death. That's what the data shows. Well, I don't mean to minimize anybody's death. Uh, I know people who've lost family members uh, and uh, every death is, is a tragedy regardless of the cause. So I'm not minimizing that. If anybody here has, has lost someone to COVID, uh, please don't get me wrong, I'm not minimizing that. But on this national scale, there's been gross miscoding of the reason for death. And I'm not going to make a statement here as to why that's happened, but I think you can pretty much imagine that for yourself. Um, I'll just state one of the two reasons. One of them is monetary, is that the hospitals would receive more money for a COVID death than for a non-COVID death. Uh, and, and I can understand why they would want things to be coded that way because when elective surgeries and other elective uh, procedures came to a halt because of this business of uh, isolation and uh, people being told to stay away, that cut off a you know, significant revenue source for hospitals and they needed some other way to make up that source to be able to continue to function. The other reason you can imagine. So I would like to just say that uh, going back to Revelation 21 here, that God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So through this last year we've had, there's been a tremendous amount of pain, death, sorrow, uh, aggravation. And so I do not mean to minimize that at all. But here's the promise that in the future, all of that will go away and that we can trust the Lord for that. Well, for the first few weeks after this was published by a, a newsletter there at Johns Hopkins University, uh, there was no big stir about this uh, evaluation of the data. But once it got widely dispersed by uh, other entities, then uh, Johns Hopkins ended up retracting this well, you can imagine there was a lot of monetary and political pressure put on them to do that. But the data was valid and doesn't change. So there's been so much going on uh, in the way of politicization of all this stuff that's been happening this last year. So I want to bring to your attention a quote. I'm just using Johns Hopkins consistently here as a very super a reputable source. But what I'm going to show you in these next couple slides, also the same thing happened with the World Health Organization and with other um, well-established, respected uh, health institutes, both in the U.S. and in Britain and other places as well. So this was 
uh, published in September of 19, before this whole thing began, September of 19. Quarantine measures will be least effective for pathogens, that means things that cause disease, that are highly transmissible, have short incubation periods, and spread through airborne mechanisms, as opposed to droplets, in other words, things that will stay suspended in the air, such as viruses, that are not attached to a blob of mucus. As with travel restrictions, quarantine appears to delay the introduction of highly transmissible diseases, but not prevent their spread entirely. So what they're saying here is, before this whole thing began, um, shutting down things isn't really going to do that much. But then what happened in April? Just the opposite was being said, not only by Johns Hopkins, but by other institutes as well. Well, here you see a chain leak fence. Now watch very carefully as you see something zip through it here. But this didn't zip through. Now, what, what you were supposed to see before that was one dot going through the fence. Okay, and that would be the virus by itself. But this would be a bunch of viruses stuck on a blob of mucus. So the fence represents the mask. All right? And that one little dot that you were supposed to see zipping through across um, is not stopped by the mask if it's a free-floating virus. If it's stuck on mucus, then the mask does stop it. Oh, there, did you see it go by? There it is, going by. That's what the virus does when it's not attached to a blob of mucus. So what I'm saying then is in terms of real effectiveness, these don't do much. Now, I, there may be very important for folks for having a, a psychological sense of security, and, but that's not the real solution to the problem. Okay, uh, I'm showing you this because of this concept of hang time. You may be familiar with football. If that kicker can get that ball to hang up really high in the air for a long time, it gives the guys time to run downfield um, to be able to help intercept the uh, receiver. Well, these viruses have a long hang time. And so that's why it does make sense to not have closely packed people indoors. And that's why you all are spaced out very wisely. And outdoors, things disperse, and so that's why it's safer to be together outdoors. So here you see the business of the mask, and you can see how the masks do not contain, as you see the, the green um, dispersion there. Now, of the masks, homemade masks, cotton flannel, and you see there is a good old U of A mask. Um, I bleed red and blue. Um, cotton flannel is actually one of the more effective of the homemade masks, uh, as well as double-layered cotton, and that's Firestore, and that's uh, Arizona Christian University. Uh, the 100% polyester is, uh, of the synthetic factor, uh, masks, more uh, effective. <laughs> Believe it or not, you can make a very effective one from a shop vac filter to buy at Home Depot and then line it with cotton, all right? And then if something has the form-fitting feature to it, that makes it more effective. But the best of all are these professional ones that are called N95 because they are guaranteed to get at least 95% of the airborne particles uh, um, not to go through them, and actually, they, they actually test out to more closer to 99%. They're, they're very well made, uh, if they're made here in the U.S., not in China. And then uh, the other one is uh, rated at 99.97 from the Department of Energy there. And so it shows you the size of the virus compared uh, to the size of what these things can filter out, and so these are very effective. And then there are these face shields, um, and they are quite ineffective, as you see. And stuff goes down and then out. So on a scale here, from zero to 100% effectiveness, there's the shield, there's the homemade masks, and then there's the N95 type. 
all right? Hand washing. Okay, this is why hand washing is important. Virus travel agency, and he says doorknob okay? So hand washing is effective, it's helpful, because for a short period of time, the, you can pick up the virus from a doorknob or something. So that's why hand washing is effective. At least 20 seconds of scrubbing time, no cheating. Social distancing is effective. This shows that uh, if a person engages in normal social activity, they will affect, infect 22 and a half people in uh, five days, and over the course of a month, that exponentially increases to 406 people. Okay, if you decrease your activity by half, only one and a quarter people in five days, and then 15 people over the course of a month, and then if you are 75% less uh, engaging with folks, then it cuts down uh, again in half, and so you see a big difference between two and a half people versus 406. So social distancing is very effective. So, you know, my, uh, you know, if someone is truly concerned, they really should, if they're co really concerned, they have valid concerns, you know, they have underlying diseases, uh, then they should stay home, not rely on the mask. Well, there's been purposeful confusion of various terms here, and I want to just clear these up for you. Isolation is keeping apart the people who actually have the disease, the ones who actually have the disease, isolation. In the emergency department and in other rooms and hospitals, we have isolation rooms, and in those rooms, we actually use negative air pressure, where the air comes into the room from outside of the room and then is vented out through a special um, duct and then is dealt with with filters. That's true isolation. Quarantine, that is to confine people who are exposed to others who have the disease, but those people themselves don't have the disease. So isolation, you're isolating the person who has it. Quarantine is isolation of those who have been in contact with those who have the disease but don't have the disease themselves. And then lockdown, that's government mandated shutting mass quarantine, shutting down whole areas, communities, states, or countries. And then social distancing. So this is voluntary measures encouraged by governments but not required. So I think social distancing is definitely the way to go. Well, about quarantine, I'd just like to give you a bit of history. This is the, the town of Dubrovnik in Croatia on the Dalmatian coast of the Adriatic Sea. And this is where the concept of quarantine was first developed, back in the uh, medieval times when the bubonic plague was killing a third of all the people in Europe. So you see it's a walled city, the original city is walled there. And so what they did was they set out food and water a uh, significant distance from the city and they had little uh, stations there where people were kept for 40 days and if they remained free of disease after those 40 days, then they were admitted into the city. And that's how we get the word quarantine. Uh, those of you who speak Spanish know that 40 is cuarenta, that same root, quarantine, cuarenta. So that concept was developed there in uh, Croatia. Well, here's another quote uh, from the director of health security at Johns Hopkins. So in January of 2020, he said, Large-scale quarantine for a COVID will be ineffective and could have big negative consequences. This is January of last year. Then in April, lockdowns in the U.S. should not be lifted without declines in new cases, widespread testing, and the use of non-medical masks by the public. So you see there's a 180-degree flip there, and you can guess what kind of pressure was applied to these folks to say these things. Uh, about prophylaxis, prevention. Uh, here is one of many protocols. Uh, there are a whole bunch you can pick from, but they share many features in common, uh, such as taking significant doses of vitamin C, also quercetin. Vitamin D is also very helpful, and it's very uh, interesting that they noted that people who have always, for long periods of time, been indoors, such as people in the nursing homes, long, you know, the, the uh, long-term care facilities, never get outside, and so they're not exposed to sun, and we make vitamin D through our skin when uh, the sunlight hits our skin. It initiates a chemical 
cascade that manufactures vitamin D in our bodies. So that was one of the things that led to understanding that vitamin D is important in having greater resistance to the virus. So get out there and enjoy your sunshine, even if you're freezing your tush off out there. <laughs> uh, zinc is also helpful uh, in dealing with uh, helping to protect the hemoglobin. Uh, melatonin is a hormone that our brain makes. The pineal gland in the center of our brain makes melatonin. So supplements of melatonin have been found to be helpful as well. Um, just understand that melatonin is what makes you sleepy. When you eat turkey at Thanksgiving, you manufacture more melatonin from the tryptophan in the turkey. So uh, don't melatonin and drive. Uh, other protocols call either call for vitamin K or vitamin B. There, there's a variation on these protocols, but those are things you can do to keep yourself in top shape to uh, prevent getting uh, sick if you're exposed to the virus. Sleep a lot if you do get sick. You, the rest is crucial. Um, sleep is very helpful. You can focus, your body can focus using proteins to fight the disease. Don't expose other people. Stay home. Drink lots of fluids. With any viral infection, you need extra fluids so you don't get dehydrated. Monitor yourself. Uh, see how you're doing. Pay attention to your symptoms. Pay attention to your uh, to fever. Call the doc. Don't go see him. Call him so they can make prior proper arrangements for your visit. Uh, Over-the-counter medicines such as Tylenol, acetaminophen is Tylenol, uh, are good for the fever and uh, achiness. Uh, some, that, some folks have achiness, which is devastating. They feel like they've been run over by a steamroller. So the doc is saying, I just can't help you with antibiotics. Those are for bacteria. But now we have several antiviral agents that really help. So if someone is admitted to the hospital, they're sick enough to be in the hospital. One of the drugs that's being used uh, significantly is called remdesivir. It's an analog of one of the molecules that is in the alphabet of DNA, those four letters, um, A, T, C, and G, the A, adenosine. And it's, uh, it, what it does is it gums up the machinery so that the virus can't be reproduced and uh, continue on. That's given through uh, IV, uh, line. Uh, Zithromax, it's been around a long, long time. Uh, sometimes you know it, uh, hear it referred to as ZPAC, uh, Zithromax. Um, it's, it's an antibiotic, but it does have a certain antiviral effect. Uh, steroids are only effective in patients who need oxygen and ventilation, artificial ventilation. Otherwise, they are not helpful. And there are other drugs that are being used as well. There, there, there's a lot of research going on all around the world. Hydroxychloroquine, which was initially uh, touted, is, uh, also has uh, mixed results, but I'm not sure that they're so mixed. It may be that um, there were financial reasons for it to be poo-pooed. Uh, I'll get into that a bit later. Um, uh, some folks have had great results with that. And then convalescent plasma refers to receiving antibodies from the blood of a person who's already had the disease. So their immune system is cranked up. They make lots of antibodies. They donate blood. Those antibodies are then transfused into another person. Uh, this was one of the things that was given to uh, President Trump when he uh, had the virus. And that is fantastic. That's, that's like silver bullets, magic bullets right away. And then there's these other uh, categories of things uh, referring to folks who have long-term uh, problems such as rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, some of the drugs for that seem to help as well. Uh, here's an interesting uh, animation here showing another possibility that is being investigated where a very small molecule uh, is uh, given to the person and it then binds to the uh, COVID virus and causes the virus to change shape so that it can no longer be reproduced. It's a very interesting uh, approach which is uh, being investigated right now. Uh, another very interesting uh, aspect of this whole picture is surveilling the wastewater, the waste treatment systems. 
And so a lot of the universities, including the University of Arizona, uh, were monitoring the sewage from different dormitories. So they would, uh, you know, take it, they know it came from that particular dormitory and would check it and see if the presence of virus and then they would screen everybody in that particular dormitory. And for, an, and for one example, in one dorm, uh, they tested all the 311 people who either worked or uh, lived in that uh, dorm, and they found only two students who did not have symptoms. Everybody else was fine. So it's very interesting. You know, young people do well with this. They do very well. I've had several of my students who have gotten it, uh, from uh, participating in the athletic teams and they're in close contact and so it's spread around. And they've had uh, symptoms for a few days, uh, some of them extremely minimal, like a couple hours of fever and maybe a day of achiness. Others felt really tired for a whole week and then they were all fine. In North Dakota, it's very interesting as they were surveilling the sewage systems in all of these different cities. Now, this, this, this leads to interesting things uh, about uh, civil rights and all sorts of stuff people can get wound up about uh, uh, if they're forced to go through testing and all this other stuff. Uh, so it, it'll be interesting to see where this winds up. Uh, for testing, there's two categories of tests, either testing uh, for the virus itself to see if a person has the virus at the time of the test, and so there, there are these specimens with uh, the nasal swabs, and then those are accurate in the first week after symptoms start. Or there's testing to see if you have the antibody to the virus. In other words, that at some point in time, that doesn't tell you when, that you had the virus prior to the time of testing and you produced your own antibodies to the virus and so that you've been exposed and had it at one time, but it doesn't tell you when you had it. What about vaccines? So this has become a big question. Um, in one type of vaccine, a, a harmless virus that does nothing to us is actually used to introduce part of the protein from the COVID virus into your body so that your body will make antibodies to the COVID protein and then fight it off. Okay, so that's how it is. So that is used to make your system stimulated to make antibodies to part of the protein of the virus. The beauty of this is you don't get exposed to the whole virus because in the past, all of the viral vaccines were what they called attenuated live virus in which they would weaken the virus uh, but it was still, well, you can't say live in the sense of an organism because it doesn't have life like bacteria or we do, but they would say live virus, but an intact virus that is weakened and so occasionally someone would still get the disease itself from the vaccine. But that's not possible with this procedure. You can't get the disease from the vaccine. That's a beauty of this uh, technique. Okay, and another one, then using some of the, viru uh, the RNA, the virus itself, a portion of it, just a portion of it, put it into you so that you manufacture that protein from the virus, and then your immune system makes the antibodies to that protein. So again, you're not going to get the disease itself from the vaccine. So your body makes that viral protein, both cases, the protein is recognized as not self, and your antibodies are manufactured to the uh, virus, the COVID virus, and you cannot get the disease from the vaccine. That's, that's very slick. What about side effects from the vaccine after the first or second dose? Okay, there can be pain, redness, or swelling where the shot was given, but that happens with any vaccine. Uh, sure happened to me when I had a bunch of them given to me in the past. Uh, you can develop fever, fatigue, see the person's wiped out there, headache, 
muscle pain, chills, and joint pain. Well, this is typical of uh, pretty much any vaccine and uh, doesn't sound a whole lot different from getting the disease, does it? But again, this is not from the disease, just from the vaccine. Well, there's a very interesting thing going on uh, now in the news, and um, I'm not sure why it's surfacing right now, but New York City, that was the epicenter of the, of the whole thing, where more people died there than anywhere else and disproportionately in the elderly population. Well, what they did at the orders of the governor, as I understand it, uh, is that uh, people, elderly people who had been in nursing homes were taken to the hospital, had the disease, were after treatment in the hospital, sent back to the nursing homes. Well, what do you think that would do? Spread the disease. Uh, so there's a big thing in the news right now about that. Uh, it's coming to light now, so I don't know what's going to come of that, but uh, it was not the best way to handle the situation. So there was a tremendous um, situation where those older folks were dying there uh, in that situation. Under 18, the death rate is zero per 100,000. Okay, young people do well. So who to vaccinate? So in the, it's been established that first will be the health care providers and the first responders. So nurses, docs, uh, EMT, uh, medics, and police. Then after that, the elderly and those at risk. So these are the folks who are in the stages of being vaccinated now. And educators, uh, K through 12, are first in line among the educators and then folks... Uh, at the higher levels. And so as of, okay, I, I just updated this um, in my computer, but you don't have the most current version here, but now it's over, I think, 44 million now, as of yesterday, have been administered. And I also made a slide for you folks, giving you the website uh, here. You can Google Cochise County and COVID, and you can get the website where to get the information for what to do here uh, in this county uh, for locations of places. And then signing up. Signing up's tricky because the slots are pretty much taken, but uh, that's where you can get the information for Cochise County. Who not to vaccinate? Uh, immunocompromised uh, people, as Pastor was referring to, uh, those are the folks who need to definitely uh, be in isolation. Uh, or quarantine, actually. Uh, people who have severe allergies. There are uh, children less than 12 uh, need not to be vaccinated, and those who are pregnant. You don't need to be putting um, that uh, viral DNA into pregnant ladies. As there's a study done at Monash University, uh, published uh, in December, showing that at that point in time that indeed the immune system remembers how to make the uh, antibody and that the protection is, is good for at least that period of time. Well, the reason it's eight months because that's only the period of time where the study's been going on. But I suspect that period of time will be much longer as it is for uh, the situations in which we make antibodies to other uh, disease-causing organisms as well. What about complications? Uh, well, three people, one in the US and two Britons, had anaphylaxis, and that's going into shock from an allergic reaction. So that's happened to three people that's been documented. Uh, kind of a funny thing is that a few people who previously had received uh, injections for cosmetic enhancement to fill out their cheeks, you know, so they look younger, don't look so wrinkled. They have stuff injected into their cheeks. Uh, they've had some local uh, inflammation there, uh, but that was easily treated and not a serious problem. Uh, then a uh, uh, few people uh, have had uh, paralysis of the facial nerve, the seventh cranial nerve, and um, 
don't know yet how well they're resolving. Uh, in, in other situations in which I've treated patients who develop this kind of a palsy or weakness, uh, paralysis in the facial nerve, with time, almost always it resolves and they do just fine. Um, we'll, we'll see how these folks turn out. So again, that's an older number. I think it's closer to 44 million now uh, have been vaccinated. There are various reports, but these reports are not uh, verified. They're not in, uh, investigated as of yet to see if these claims are related to the virus or if it's something else that happened and the timing happened to coincide uh, with the vaccination. Um, but you see here these uh, various uh, things that are listed and it'll be um, good to see what shakes out after things have been thoroughly investigated to see what's actually going on. So it says, uh, someday, just for a change, why can't we send an American flu to Asia? <laughs> All right. Before I take questions, I want to read something to you, and this will go back to what I alluded to uh, earlier. Okay, remdesivir was one of those drugs that was listed as what's being administered uh, in uh, hospital in-care situations. Well, it might be interesting you for to know that the patent for remdesivir is currently held by China. Through an agreement with Gilead, a drug patent sharing subsidiary called Unitaid, which just happens to have an office near Wuhan, China. Well, who are some major financial investors in this uh, Unitaid uh, subsidiary? Well, it's George Soros, Bill and Melinda Gates, and the World Health Organization. Is that just a coincidence? Well, both Gilead Sciences and Unitaid were financial backers of Hillary Clinton. What about Dr. Fauci? Well, he authorized, you know, the fellow who's been out front speaking from National Institute of Health. He authorized millions of American dollars to be sent to the Wuhan Institute of Virology in China, specifically for the study of coronaviruses. Oh yeah, and Dr. Fauci's wife works for Gilead Sciences. Do you see a network here? It goes, the, the, these coincidences, so-called coincidences, go on and on. But I did want to read three pages to you. So it's very interesting because, for example, chloro hydroxychloroquine, as I said, uh, supposedly mixed results. Well, the problem is that's an extremely cheap drug that you can get through American companies here in this country. You don't have to deal with these entities on this sheet I just read to you. So you can see how there has been tremendous, let's say, um, negative publicity about that. And it's very possible for financial and political reasons. So it's very hard to sort through all the stuff regarding this, this whole thing because all of it's been politicized. So you can see so much conflicting stuff uh, on the internet uh, because of that. Now, you don't see so much conflicting stuff on the news. Why? Because the so-called news is so, I would say, to be kind, rather filtered, shall we say. Other words that might apply to it uh, would be censored. Um, but I'll leave that up to you to judge. So that's what I had to say about coronavirus, coronavirus in specific. And then and during the service, we'll talk about viruses in general about um, the evolutionary uh, attempt to explain viruses, their existence, and, th and then the biblical model for viruses, what positive role they serve, and then talk about uh, a few things, uh, other, uh, how we use viruses for, uh, to kill infections or to treat cancer. I'll talk about, a, about five or six uh, viral diseases very briefly, and that will be in the main service. 
what I'd like to point out to you is that uh, out that away in the corner there, we have a table of resources for things f uh, that hopefully you will be motivated to purchase either for yourself or as gifts to other people to get the truth out there about uh, the truth of Scripture and how science actually confirms Scripture. But we have a bunch of freebies for you as well, donated by the Creation Research Society. And so um, for every family, each family can uh, pick up a copy of the argument, creation versus evolutionism. So these are freebies. And also the Creation Research Society donated a whole bunch of issues of the Answers magazine put out by Answers in Genesis. So these we have as freebies for you folks. So please take them, make use of them. And if you want to take a few extra copies of the magazines to give to other people you specifically have in mind, please do so. We want to get the truth out there so folks can know what the real story is. So if you have questions, I'll take them now. Yes, sir. Okay, you had the virus, you had COVID, and so you're asking about the vaccine, sh whether or not you should take it? I would say no, because you've already, you're already building up your own antibodies. That's what I thought too. Yeah. Yes, sir. Along, well, along those lines, and then I have a, a, a separate question. Our, our doctor told us to wait 90 days before we took the vaccine. After having, after having been, after having had COVID. And you're saying that we've built those antibodies and we know that there's no... Sense. Well, I'll put it this way. If I get the virus, I'm not going to take the vaccine. Depends what happens first. Um, I'm able to qualify for the vaccine at this time because I am a professor, but I couldn't sign up for it because all the slots have been taken. <laughs> and and um, so if I get the vaccine first, great. If I get the virus first, then I'm not going to bother with the vaccine. And then my, my other question was is that there seems to be, there seems to be two theories out there. Once you've had the virus, you're immune to it after that. And then there's another theory that says, no, you're not. You can, you can contract it again. Yes, I, I, I've heard of uh, folks uh, who have said that they had it and they think they got it again. Uh, I don't know what to say about that um, unless there was very rigorous testing and they, to be able to show that they had a new spike in producing their antibodies to a second course of the disease. That's the only way to be able to know what's actually happened. And as you know, as I mentioned, some of the many of these symptoms are the same as the flu. Well, do you think the flu has gone away? No, it's still out there. So maybe one time they got the flu, another time they got the coronavirus. I, I mean, you don't know unless you can test them specifically. That's the only way you can really answer that question meaningfully. Sorry, that's not really of any help to you, but. Right. And so we did, but we wound up, then we wound up going to the hospital a week later, and they said, well, since you've had, since you've had the virus this, this long, there's, there's really nothing that we can give you. That the treatment has to be given at the onset of the virus, not a week later. Well, the treatment is more effective the earlier it started, and that's true for the course of any disease. And if you're not sick enough to be admitted to the hospital, then I would say that's a true statement. But if you're so sick that you need to be admitted, then there are these other things that they would then employ if you're that sick. So I think that's what they're trying to say. Does that make sense? All right. Yes, ma'am. Um, 
Yes. Okay. Autoimmune questions about autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases are when your immune system makes an antibody to some type of cell in your body. And there, there's a very, very long list of autoimmune diseases. Uh, one of the best known ones is lupus erythematosus, for example, or um, the juvenile onset of diabetes uh, can be an autoimmune disease. So, so the issue is there is concern that if the virus is given and you have autoimmune diseases, it may trigger you to make more new types of antibodies to yourself. And yes, that's a valid concern. Yeah, that, that valid con that concern is about folks who have an autoimmune disease, right? Because that means that their immune system is hyper-triggered in the first place. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, you've had the coronavirus, and the question is, how long are you contagious, is, I think is really your question. Yeah, because it's confusing because sometimes you can still be sick, right? But they'll give you the short period of time, the 10 days, but you could be sick for three months. Okay, well, they're in the hospital because they are so much sicker, and what they're doing is recovering from the effects of the virus, although they... Those, so don't confuse how long they're sick with how long they're contagious, all right? Because they have such bad symptoms that they need, most likely it's they need to be on a ventilator is why they're in the hospital so long. And so uh, that doesn't mean they're still contagious uh, all during that whole three-month period. But generally the rule is if you're symptomatic, you're contagious. And after 10 days uh, or so, you should not be contagious any longer, unless you're so sick that you're in the hospital. But again, that's about the degree of illness, not the period of being contagious. Okay. Yes. Um, I don't know which infusion you're talking about. There are various drugs which are given uh, IV. Um, and so I can't really answer the question unless I know what it is they're giving. Okay. All right. Okay, I think what you're referring to is going to be one of these agents that deals with preventing the virus from being able to be reproduced in your cells. I think that's what you're talking about. <laughs> I've already had yeah, I think that most likely that's what you're talking about. Um, Do you think they work? Think uh, yeah. They yeah. 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 Yeah, the idea is to keep you getting so sick you don't end up in the situation where you're in there three months. It's to prevent you from getting so sick. Yeah. No, this is the first time that they're using this technology of taking a short, fairly short portion of the viral RNA and giving that to the people. This is, this is rather new. But it's, uh, uh, the concept is fantastic, rather than giving the attenuated live virus, where you can still get the disease from the vaccine. 
uh, I, think it, I think it's a great idea, but we won't know until time has passed to see what the long-term effects. I mean, you just won't know. Um, can't say until the time has gone by. Yes, it, it could be the first of its category where all sorts of future vaccines are going to be made that way. There are theoretical concerns about it, but they're theoretical and we won't know until time has gone by. Okay, so. What are some of those theoretical concerns? One of them is that it could possibly affect uh, implantation of an embryo uh, at the earliest part of pregnancy. It's, it's theoretical, don't know. No, that's a, to be kind, urban myth. <laughs> Misinformation. No. If you've had COVID, can you get tested to see if you have antibodies? Well, yeah, if, uh, sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, you can. You you would have to specify that you want the test for the antibodies rather than for the virus, and then they can tell you yes, you have the antibodies, and at some point in time you had the virus in the past. Well, it'll show that you after the vaccine you make antibodies, so then. Later testing should show that you have the antibodies. Well, that's the whole point of vaccination, is to make the antibodies. Yeah, it, it's to show that you have the antibodies, that it was successful vaccination, and that you have that protection. We hear constantly how much more contagious this is than the flu. What makes it so much more contagious? Um, well, okay, you say it's so much more contagious. How do you measure? I don't know how you measure. That's, that's what we're told. Right, that's my point. Yeah. That's my point. Uh, how do you measure that? That, yeah. Um, I don't have numbers to give you. But there, I'll just mention that there are virologists from various countries who say that this virus has been purposely manipulated, that this is not a totally natural situation. All right, uh, this virus is in the category of uh, the uh, coronaviruses, and they are um, one of the more stable viruses that are less prone to mutation. Can't say it's not going to happen, but it's not as frequent as some of the other categories of viruses. What about herd immunity? We hear a lot about that. Yeah, we need it. Yeah. <laughs> get, you know, be young, get the disease and then protect everybody else. <laughs> and then you get herd immunity. Yeah, it is important to protect those at risk. Very important. The elderly and those with comorbid diseases. Yes, that's very important. Exactly. So, and I have a lot of examples of that from my clients, but, so the theme to me is this, is why do we need, like, I mean, I guess if you're going to take a flu vaccine, you should take the coronavirus vaccine, but if you don't typically take those vaccines and you've been okay, it's not an increase, it's not killing more people than it had before, why would you take the vaccine? 
Well, um, it depends how quickly you want to be freed from this business of mandates for isolation, for shutting down the economy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. See, we're in a very strange situation here. Very strange situation. Well, again, the masks are useless no matter what. Well, um, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, some things become self-evident. All right, how are we doing for time? Where are we? We're done. Okay, thank you.